Hello, Spark fans. Welcome back to Advancing Spark, where I want to talk about streaming today. But not so much the actual code of streaming, more about the considerations of how you look after streaming. Now, it's been a bit of a topic from Databricks recently. They put out a couple of blogs about their collected best practices for streaming. And it also refers back to a blog they put out ages ago as part of the actual official Databricks documentation about how to manage production streaming jobs. And honestly, I've shared that that Databricks doc with so many of our clients, whenever someone asks about streaming or is doing a streaming job or asks what the best practices are, actually it's really well documented on the Databricks side. These are all the things that you need to consider. So I thought today we'll actually have a bit of a look through what those recommendations are. We'll cherry pick some of the main ones. We'll talk about why things work that way and kind of just give you some hints and tips to make sure that you are doing your streaming jobs right. If you are doing full long running streaming jobs. Not always the same if you're doing batched stream, if you're using trigger once, trigger available now, that kind of thing. Some of these recommendations don't apply. Some of them do. And we'll call that out as we go. So that is the plan for today. Talking about streaming in production and some of the best practices published by Databricks and how you can make sure you are following them. Now, a few other things. One, we have been making a bit of a hoo-ha this week because the Advancing Analytics Academy is now live. So if you're just getting started with Spark or you've got a team that you're trying to onboard and get up to speed and you want someone to go through a Spark Fundamentals course, our very first course that Spark Fundamentals is now live on the interwebs. You can go and use it. There is a discount code for fans of the YouTube channel. So if you're a Spark fan, you can put in that coupon code to Spark fans for 10% off currently. And I'll put up a little link up in the corner uh, so you can then kind of go through to the Academy. Go check that out. That is live now and includes of me ranting about the joys of starting with Spark, reading Spark, transforming with Spark, writing out data, doing all that cool stuff with a ton of demos and quizzes and all that good stuff. And then finally, as always, if you're new around here, don't forget to like and subscribe. And yeah, let us know down in the comments if you're currently doing streaming using Spark in production. What kind of extra things have you built in on top of those production recommendations? Have you found that those recommendations that you've had to build extra workarounds because they didn't give you the production grade that you needed? Or are you just seeing these and going, oh, that's why we should have done it. That's the plan. Anyway, let's go have a look at the recommendations. So let's start on the documentation side. So I'll do a quick run through uh, the two blog posts with, the, with some of the recommendations. But the main thing is having a look at what the, the core ones that have been out for ages, how we look after structured streaming in production. So I'm on, I'm on the uh, Amazon docs to start off with, but again, could be Azure, could be GCP. The actual recommendations are very, very similar across the board. So what have we got? Number one, using notebooks for structured streaming. A couple of recommendations about how you run Spark jobs if you're using notebooks for your code. Now, for me, that's yes, I'm using notebooks for my code. All of my code is run through notebooks. Now, that's the supportability thing. So I could have streaming going on I will run it in a notebook. I won't compile it down to a jar and run it that way. Um, the reason being, I want my support team, if something goes wrong, to be able to go and have a look at a notebook, have a look at different outputs, be able to go and actually sort of visually get that kind of um, thing with markdown and documentation about what code actually ran, rather than have to build in a huge amount of telemetry and logging into my own code. I'm lazy. I just want it done in a nice, visual, explorable, standardized way. So yeah, absolutely, we use notebooks. So some best practices about that. Well, first, what happens when it goes wrong? And most of all these recommendations are about what happens if it goes wrong and what can lead it to going wrong. So number one, checkpointing. Now, checkpointing is mandatory most for most of the things that you're trying to put data into when using Spark Streaming. So a lot of times, if you try and get away without using a checkpoint, it'll tell you off and say, mate, you, you have to use a checkpoint. Now, what this is doing is storing some metadata down in the lake. Now, for me, I always store it in my destination table. So if I'm going from a source to a destination, I've got my lake path for my destination. Simply add that lake path, I add another folder called underscore checkpoint. So if you look in a desk in one of my kind of uh, folders in the lake, you'll likely see underscore delta underscore log because it's a delta table and underscore checkpoint because it's got the checkpoint of data being streamed into it. And maybe underscore schema if I'm streaming through something like autoloader and I'm allowing Autoloader to do the schema management for me. Now that convention of having underscore, that's a Hive convention. Spark will just ignore any data inside a folder that begins with an underscore. 
assuming it's metadata, and that's exactly what this is. So yeah, as a convention, one, make sure you do checkpointing, and two, put it somewhere next to your data so you can find where your checkpoints are. Kind of makes sense. Now, what does that mean? What does a checkpoint actually do? Well, Spark, whenever it does the Spark to streaming, it works in a micro batch. Essentially, it's not a true Spark, uh, it's not a true streaming compute engine. It's not going to do a bit of compute for every single record that goes through. It runs on micro batches. So every 10 seconds, every 30 seconds, every minute, every whatever interval you trigger, it's going to be saying, what records have been come in since I last ran? Cool, grab those in as a micro batch, process them all together, write that in, get the next one. So it's always going in that micro batch style. And a checkpoint, essentially, when it gets to the end of the, uh, the micro batch, it'll write down to the checkpoint, this is what I've just done. So if something breaks, if something goes horribly wrong and your spark cluster dies, it gets out of memory, everything falls over. Well, because you've got a checkpoint written as metadata down into the disk, that means it can start again from where it got to. So if I had an entirely different Databricks workspace and I redeployed my code and I pointed at that data, I can hit start and it'll carry on from where it left off because the state, the, the place it got to, the watermark of where it, which records from the source it had actually read are stored in my metadata in that checkpoint folder. So if I'm reading from like an event hub in Azure and that's got loads of records coming in and I've read up to my thousandth record, everything stops. I turn it back on and it goes, oh, I've read up to my thousandth record. I'll just carry on from a thousand and one. So checkpoints, absolutely vital for recovering from any kind of failure, from recovering from any kind of problems. Use checkpointing. It just, just is baked in. And it, lots of the time it forces you to. But that then, that concept of the fact that Spark's expecting to fail. Spark is, I mean, that's the whole point of Spark, is it's meant to be something that can scale out massively. And if something breaks, it just spins up another node and carries on going. That is the entire whole point. But what happens if it's going for a long, long, long time? If you turn streaming on and you leave it for a week, for a month, for 10 months, for a year, then something's going to break. Your workers are eventually going to fall over. These things are not meant to be big, long running services. So what happens is if something breaks, it restarts and it just carries on. If your whole cluster goes down, great, restart it, just carry on. And it can carry on because of the checkpoint. So nearly all of the guidance around how you look after streaming in production is all about, well, just make sure it restarts when it breaks. Not if it breaks, when it breaks, because that's the assumption. So whenever we've got things that we're doing, if we had a Databricks workflow, we're using jobs inside Databricks workflows, and we're using that to manage those notebooks, all the recommendations are always retry on the failure. Just have unlimited tries. It doesn't matter how many times it breaks. If it's turned on for a year, it's going to break more than 10 times in that year, but no one will notice because it'll have broken and come back up quite happily. So expect your Spark queries to have failures that just cause a mild blip that no one really sees and it just continues. That's how Spark works. So absolutely, whenever you're running things, expect to be failures, have unlimited failures. Uh, and generally, if you can run on a new cluster, that will largely be managed for you. So in terms of a data workflow, what that would look like, well, one, always be using a new cluster if you can do. So use a shared job cluster across multiple things running on the same cluster. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, you can have email notifications on failures, but a lot of the time the, it'll say, I failed, but I've continued. Oh, I, I failed last night, but I continued. And it doesn't really matter. It's only if you get multiple failures and it can't restart that you actually have to worry. Uh, scheduling, well, we don't set a schedule because it's, it's always turned on. It's not a start the stream at this time, uh, start a time. It's not a certain time of day, start the stream. It's just your stream is turned on. And if it breaks, it'll turn itself back on. Shouldn't time out. You don't, I mean, if you're doing permanent live streaming, you don't want it to just stop. That's the point. Uh, concurrent runs, you want one. You don't want to be trying to run the same stream with the same checkpoints and micro batches get in the way. You definitely want concurrent uh, set to one. And most importantly, retries set to unlimited. Doesn't matter how many times this thing breaks because it's just going to keep on going. And that's exactly how it works. So if we jump over to um, like a Databricks job, so if I jump into jobs, I just made a quick jobs example there. Uh, if we dive into something like this, we can see what that would look like. I've got two tasks. I've got two streams running concurrently. 
Uh, they're going to share the same job cluster. Just to zoom in a little bit so you guys can see that. So I want to share job cluster these two streams are going on across. Um, I'm using a notebook with them. So you can see there is a notebook type. I'm pointing it to a notebook. And actually, you'll see I'm using the same notebook. So I can still do framework automation. I can still make generic code and run it multiple times in, in parallel with, with different parameters. That's all absolutely fine. It's just each instance of that stream will have different runtime parameters that I'm passing in and passing in different parameters. So I'm using a notebook, passing in a parameter, they're sharing a job cluster. We'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, I've not done any dependencies because I don't want one stream to finish then the next one because the stream never finishes. So lots of things running in parallel. Now, in this case, I have set up failures. So I've said I do want it to um, manage um, email me every time it breaks. Now, again, depends on how many times you want to be emailed in a day, if it does break lots of times. But in this case, I've set yes, please, please send failures over to a support email address. And crucially, that retries, I've said, make that unlimited. I don't want it to reach a certain point when it just won't restart again. So retries are unlimited. And how long should it wait before it retries again? Now, that might be waiting for a cluster to come back up. That might be five minutes saying I want it to come back up, but give it time for the cluster to reboot if that is the issue. Um, it might be uh, two minutes just because it's going quite quick, or maybe it's on a, um, a compute pool. So it's going to spin up a new cluster nice and quickly. Whatever that happens to be, whatever the reasonable amount of outage before it tries again is for you. And should it retry in a timeout just in case there's anything going on, any driver issues? Yeah, sure, fine. So, yeah, that kind of setup. So if I had five different streams going on, I'd have five different concurrent jobs, not of them dependent on each other, all with that same setup of infinite retries, no timeouts, keep running, and if it breaks, just start again. It's the whole point. So lots of stuff uh, in there. Uh, now there's other things we can do. So, you know, you can do inside your code how we should manage changes. You should, you know, in terms of delta tables, they've got specific options and lots of deeper things in there. We're not going to go too much in that. It depends on the individual things. So useful stuff. Generally, the most useful is thinking about how you're structuring those workflows and how you're structuring, you know, the checkpoints and where you put those checkpoints. Okay, other things. Um, so there's some useful stuff in terms of you've got loads of metrics. And there's, there's metrics that you can define manually. So you can have your, you know, your query list and all that kind of stuff. But there's also loads of metrics that it does itself. And we'll dive over to the um, the articles in a second to have a little bit more of a look at that. Um, now, multiple, multiple streams running against a given cluster. Now, I'm really happy to see this recommendation. Because uh, yeah, a few years ago, I was working with clients uh, and I was hearing kind of they'd, they'd spoken to Databricks and heard advice from Databricks that each stream should be on its own cluster. And that's a very expensive way to stream a lot of data in. If you're bringing something that has that kind of separate domain separation, you're calling an API and it has products and customers and sales and transactions and accounts and all these different things and you have to stitch them together, but they're coming in as a live stream separately. Well, having a separate cluster for each of them is a huge expense. Um, so there's some really good advice here actually about going, no, you know what? There are people, it just makes sense to have these five different things are all interrelated. If one of them stops working, I don't, it doesn't make sense to keep streaming the others anyway. It's fine. We can tie them all together on a cluster. And if one breaks, they all break and we'll restart it and it's fine. Um, so actually the advice now coming from Databricks is great to see it has changed to go. You can have multiple streams on the same cluster. Hallelujah. But actually you can control a little bit more the slice of that cluster that each of those different streams is using. And it comes down to this thing called scheduler pools. So we've got this idea saying, well, actually, in the notebook, that could be a parameter that pass in. We can control that by a message. We can go figure out when we initialize it. Uh, but we can give that local property inside that session. So in each of the notebooks, somewhere in there, give it this idea of going, well, actually, I don't want in this pool or this pool or this pool. Which is, yeah, definitely, definitely interesting. So that actually means that even though we can have lots and lots of things going on on the same cluster, we can say these are running in different pools. Don't let them steal each other's resources. Distribute resources evenly between these different pools. In this case of their example, they're running two things on the same pool. They don't really care if they steal each other's resources. That's fine. And one thing's on a separate dedicated pool. 
so yeah definitely definitely an interesting approach for actually sort of managing the scheduling of different things so enabling you to have things on the same cluster but without them really getting each other away now you need to be careful with that so if you do have multiple things multiple streaming jobs running on the same cluster it's gonna put a bit of an overhead on your driver uh, and we'll have a look at uh, some of those things there's some of those things in their recommendations about what that can actually what problems that will cause so yeah definitely interesting things in terms of you know the the practicalities of working with this stuff uh in production now batch size and frequency is another thing that we end up seeing so if you have a certain one of your micro batches they're nice and small and then suddenly there's a massive one that can cause issues in terms of well latency it'll just take longer to process that micro batch so suddenly if you're getting records through every 10 seconds every 30 seconds and then suddenly there's five ten minutes go by and then you get a huge surge of records that doesn't look great if you're trying to do a, a live stream um so there's lots of different options that they just go through here saying how many files should be done in each trigger or how many bytes are in each trigger just to try and say if it was if you're doing file based streaming of using autoloader and it sees suddenly a great whack of files come in should it not actually try and do them all at once and go well actually i'll take the first three then the next three the next three the next three and just just put a little bit of control around how many files or how many rough amounts of uh, data is coming in in each particular batch now be aware that won't work across what a single file so if you were doing file based loading and then you got a file in and that one file was 20 gig and you're saying well it should only do a three gig limit well it's just it has to read the whole file it can't read part of a file as a single batch and then the next part of the file is the next batch so the smallest unit of work you can do is a file should it kind of make sense uh so yeah definitely makes sense to think about that and have that begged in and have those as part and parcel of what you're doing now i don't want to go deeply into stateful streaming so most of what we're doing when we're talking about building etl systems and getting real-time streaming going through your pipelines isn't actually doing stateful streaming we're not trying to do aggregates within a time window and manage the state of those different aggregates and then as things updated update those numbers before we write it out that's what stateful streaming tends to be worrying about most of the time when we're saying i want data to be getting to my end users as fast as possible uh but when even using that for etl i'm trying to get you know my data into my uh bronze layer and then into my silver layer as fast as possible i'm not actually doing a lot of uh, stateful queries on there i tend to be doing row by row uh transformations which i can manage fairly easily okay so they they're the main bits of production uh things that's the advice that's been around for ages that's been in there saying well this is how people should manage it. i've shared that with many 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 a person so the two blocks that came out recently again kind of only over the last month is kind of taking that and building on it so i'd recommend having a run through this in just as some terms of some good advice it builds on top of those recommendations things like how to test your code or the fact that you should test your streaming code i mean hopefully that that just makes sense but there's lots of things in there so one if you're building out you know again the, the example that i had i'm using the same notebook with different parameters so i can framework i can template out the code i'm using which means it's a bit more testable i can test it once and then just parameterize it and reduce the number of deployments reduce the amount of code change reduces the inherent risk of managing that data making your data divided into testable chunks and especially for things like for each batch so if you've not seen it, I did a video a little while ago about how to do merges in a Delta stream. Now, if you're using a either a type of upsert that's not supported by streaming, or you're writing to an output sync, a destination that's not supported by streaming, you have to use this thing called for each batch. And that's essentially saying, well, each micro batch, is just a batch job. It's just using normal Spark inside the stream. So I'm just going to give you a function that takes a data frame and then just writes it out in the same way I'd write any other Spark uh data frame right now problem is that has to be that's a single function called for each batch and that can get quite hefty if you're doing some transformations some aggregation to writing out to multiple destinations that's getting into be a bigger and bigger and bigger function but as they advise you can break up the function that it calls into there to do the incremental steps take a data frame do some stuff to it pass the data frame out take another data frame do some stuff to it pass the data frame back out and by doing that you can build tests around those incremental building blocks and then just make your code 
just a lot more reliable. So absolutely makes sense or makes sense about how that fits together. Yeah, any function, any function manipulating data frame should take the data frame and pass back a data frame. Treat it as like a little micro data frame service all makes sense. There's some recommendations about doing unit testing in Spark. So if you're not doing any testing currently, you should be. And there's some good uh, advice about what to get into. Uh, triggers. The so triggers are, is the interesting one. There's two different approaches for triggers. There's either actual streaming triggers as to how often it should keep running. And then there's more of the batch triggers, which is it'll run once and then stop once it's caught up. So in this case, they're talking about the processing triggers. So I want to process every 30 seconds. So every 30 seconds, it'll kick off a new micro batch unless there's an existing micro batch running. If the existing micro batch is still running, then and it goes past 30 seconds, it'll just wait until that's finished and then immediately kick off another micro batch. And that every time that micro batch starts and stops, then the driver is involved. The driver's involved going, right, okay, you're starting. Okay, you're stopping. What's the state? Okay, kick off the next job. Make sure the checkpointing's happening. There's there is load on the driver. The more often that you're doing that triggering, the harder the driver is going to have to work. Sometimes that's absolutely fine because it has to be fast. But sometimes that's going to be, it's going to be a bit of a, a hard, a hard work on the driver because it's having to do that so often. So general advice in here. Um, certainly, I mean, this, this is hopefully, hopefully an obvious one. If the window that you're looking at, I mean, when we talk about processing, how often it should do a micro batch, we tend to be talking about, you know, 10 seconds, 30 seconds, a minute, two minutes, something like that. If it's more than 10 minutes, then don't treat it as a streaming job and have everything turned on permanently. Use trigger once or trigger available now. And that's just going to be way, 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 way more efficient because you don't even need to leave your cluster turned on. Get up to speed, turn things off, turn it back on again when it's ready to go and you'll save some money. Um, yeah, makes sense. Just have a think about how often you need to be running to actually stay up to date with some stuff. And then, yeah, in terms of these two, in terms of these batch uh, style things. So if I am running an overnight ETL, if I'm processing my data once a day, I still use streaming because I like the fact that the checkpoint knows what is processed and what it hasn't. I like the fact that Autoloader is great at working out of files and doing all the schema management stuff it does these days. So I use streaming a lot regardless of whether it's real time or whether it's batch. I still use the streaming engine to do a lot of that. Now, Trigger Once was the original. Trigger once will do as a single micro batch, it'll get up to speed. So if I'm running it every 24 hours, it'll go, right, tell me everything that has happened in 24 hours, and I'll try and do it as a single micro batch. Now, that can be way too much data, and that can end up with a load of memory spills. It can end up with just, which is taking a long time to chunk through that amount of data. Um, and if you give it those, those limits that we mentioned, the max files, the kind of uh, the max bytes, Trigger once will ignore that. It will just brute force get back up to speed. Trigger available now was introduced last year. Last year, year before, time has no meaning anymore. I don't know. Uh, and what that will do is go, right, the watermark where we're trying to get to is there. I'm currently here. And it will just start doing micro batches until the point it catches up and then it will stop. So the overall impact is the same. It starts the stream, does a load of work, catches up. But available now will respect your limits and do multiple micro batches and is therefore generally a bit more efficient if there's lots of data. Trigger once will just brute force do it as a single job. You don't need to worry about it if you've got a relatively small amount of data. If you have lots of data, definitely be using trigger available now. Um, cool. Naming your stream. This is a really, really tiny little one. But you might have noticed inside Spark Streaming, when you kick off your stream, it generates an ID. And it will say, like, when you're looking at the stream output inside the notebook, it'll say, this is your stream, and it'll have a giant GUID. Um, and it'll just have a big old horrible name to it. And that name is actually really important, because that's the same ID that's put inside the checkpoint, so that when you kick it off again, it can relate the, the new streaming job back to the original ID and keep it all consistent. But it's really hard to find where it is. Now, you can actually just um, use this option called dot query name, as part of your data frame dot write stream, I think query name, and I'll give it a name. So when you're in the Spark structured streaming UI, you'll see you'll see the query name, and it's really easy to look after it. Makes sense. You should never have a streaming job inside any of your production stuff that doesn't have a name, because it just makes supporting it just so much easier. Makes sense. Cool. 
mentioning checkpoints again that makes a lot of sense we love checkpoints again put the checkpoint somewhere sensible we put it next to our data that is all good um and there's different things around state management performance especially if you're doing stateful um streaming again rocksdb is that additional extra thing it's a it's a key value pair database that uh, you can have as part of your metadata story in the checkpoint that actually manages state rather than doing it inside the jvm's memory which means it's just generally a little bit a little bit safer you're less likely to get out of memory issues or garbage collection issues if you're doing big stream transformations if you're doing kind of aggregations over watermarks it's definitely a, a thing you should be thinking about cool uh, running multiple streams on the same cluster they they talk about that so some of those same things they talk about the scheduler pool and how all that works um again big one here make sure your driver is big enough to manage all your streams so i mentioned that there is an overhead for each stream for each micro batch that's starting and stopping, there's an overhead on your driver. So if you have 10 streaming queries or, and you've got all the workers to actually manage that amount of concurrent work, but you've got a little tiny driver with four cores, those CPUs are not going to be enough. Holding in memory the state of different things as you're trying to work out what's going on is not going to be enough. And what you'll see is either it'll start just getting out of memory exceptions or it'll get garbage collector problems. You'll get... It, um, you'll get error messages about the driver not but the, the gc threshold uh exceeded the garbage collector just because it just can't deal with the amount of stuff going on at once so that's either make a bigger driver which is normally not that big an expense because you only have one of them you've got loads and loads of workers and a tiny little driver doesn't really make much sense for managing that number of streams so make your driver bigger or break your streams up and say well actually well those five streams i'll run on that cluster those five i'll run on that cluster and balance it out that way so yeah, definitely have a think about how much load you're putting on your driver, how many cores your driver has versus how many streams you're trying to run in, in parallel. Probably work out some kind of decent metric in there. Uh, and then, yeah, it talks about the other things you're doing in terms of what you're trying to do inside the stream, how many things you're writing to, general stuff in terms of scaling out the number of workers makes a lot of sense. Um, and again, that scheduling streams, uh, sorry, schedule, um, that, those scheduler pools to allocate to a particular stream to a particular pool to allow a little slice of resourcing for each of them makes a lot of sense and finally yeah if you do have a stream which is really 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 important put that on a separate cluster or at least group together different co-located streams on separate clusters with different sizing and different priorities and all that kind of stuff you don't need to have just everything on a single cluster with just massive amounts of workers, because again, your driver's going to fall over. And the way Databricks jobs try and look after things is if one of your streams fails and you've got the retry trigger, it'll try and restart all of your streams on that same shared cluster. And that's not going to be a good experience. So think about what's a good amount. Again, they see customers typically stack between 20 to 30 streams on a cluster. That's quite a lot compared to what we see. We normally see, what, between 5 and 15, somewhere around that. But it depends on domains and size and workflow and all of that good stuff. All right, how many have we done? Oh, get long. Okay, so the second one is more to do with after I've deployed it, so less about the development of it, more about how I look after it. And there's a few bits of guidance in here. I mean, firstly, absolutely, the Spark UI has gotten way better at looking at a stream. So if you go into the Spark Structure Streaming UI and you go, okay, Structure Streaming, you've now got all of your different query names and you can find out the relevant thing that relates to your query and you can bring it up. Now, bear in mind... That'll only be available on the job cluster. So if you're running it via Databricks jobs and it has a shared job cluster, that's only, that, that view is only going to be available while that job cluster is turned on. Well, so if you stop the job, if it shuts that job cluster down, you're not going to have this view. But while things are running, if you're just looking for a general health of things, nothing's broken, nothing's turned off, nothing's failed critically, but you want to go, oh, how healthy is the stream? What's the latency? Are there any massive spikes between micro batches? That kind of stuff is now actually really nice and visible inside the structure streaming UI. And if you've named your query, you can find your results really, really nicely and really quickly. So definitely recommend you can do that. There's some other advice in here, which is more about um, how you spit out metrics, what different places you can push uh, your metrics to, places you can go and just write down your logs and things, which are super, super useful. Again, what are, what are some problems going to be, be seeing? Well, you can see your driver being overwhelmed. And again, you can see that on Ganglia. If you can get onto the job cluster before it falls over, you should be able to see your driver node is just absolutely maxed out. 
The CPUs are running like mad trying to keep your um, your micro batches going. Your memory's full because the garbage collector hasn't actually run properly because it can't catch up because it's doing too much work. You'll see lots of stuff on there. Um, if, yeah, if you're doing things and the micro batch spike suddenly goes over and it's having to spill and it runs out of memory, you'll see that on your workers. Um, so you can see different bits and pieces happening on there. Um, but again, that does rely on you being able to get onto Ganglia while the job cluster is still turned on before it's fallen over. Again, before the cluster fails. But if you're monitoring it, if you're going and having a look at it, you should be able to see some of that stuff. Uh, it's got some good advice about what can cause streaming clusters to go slower. So, yeah, because SKU comes in. And SKU's a funny thing. Because everyone goes, well, SKU, we don't worry too much about that these days. We've got adaptive query execution. That's got preemptive SKU management in there and all that kind of stuff. AQE doesn't run when it's a streaming job. So you do need to think about SKU still. So if you're coming in and you're you're doing anything inside that stream that's going to reorganize and shuffle your data, especially if it's going to shuffle it around certain column values, be careful because that can skew. And a lot of the old performance tips and techniques that we would recommend, you need to make sure are still actually taken into account inside that for each batch if you're doing it that way. Um, so yeah, be a little careful. Obviously, if you've got a stateful query and you haven't got a watermark, it's like I've got a massive timestamp. It needs to keep all of the state that's ever happened in memory. That's it's gonna run out of memory. It's gonna get really, really slow. Um, yeah, don't write to a thing that's not optimized. That's gonna go really, really slow. Lots of good advice in here in terms of how to how to manage a lot of this stuff. So yeah, I mean this is this is less of a explaining how all this stuff works. Just a recommendation if you're doing streaming in production. One, start off with the the Databricks kind of you know the documentation of. What are all of my production considerations? And there's just loads of good advice in there about how you should think about doing it. And then definitely those two blogs, I'll put a link to those two down below, just to say there's lots of good advice in there. There's lots of things they have seen with a load of Databricks customers about the good parts, the bad parts, how people tend to work, how people tend not to work. And there's lots of good stuff in there. So yeah, hopefully that little jaunt through the advice and why some of that advice actually is made um some of the tweaks that we've got in terms of their advice you know where you should put your checkpoint folder all that kind of good stuff and then yeah hopefully there's lots in there for food for thought if you've already got streaming going and you're not following those best practices just go and read all of them right now and then go and review what you're doing and saying okay do we need to just tweak a lot of our jobs to make sure all of this is catered for certainly we used to have to write things a little bit more interestingly uh, certainly before Dataryx, uh workflows got more and more functionality in there, we used to have to have things just a little bit more tied together, well, less tied together, and just tied together outside of Databricks, and it's just fairly painful to do. So, yeah, generally nice to be seen. Now, the other thing is, like, you know, a lot of our orchestration I do via external orchestrators because I want it to be data-driven, I want it to be dynamic, and, uh, you know, as I said, currently, and Dataryx workflows aren't that data-driven. But if I was using in you know, Azure something like Data Factory, I wouldn't put Data Factory on top of a streaming job because the streaming job's just going to keep running, hopefully forever. And I don't want to pay for another orchestration tool to be sat there managing it. So use DataX workflows for your streaming jobs. Use the built-in retry mechanisms. Use the built-in notifications, and just you'll just generally have a much better and cheaper time of things. All right, so that is all I wanted to run through today. Again. Do check out the new Advancing Analytics Academy for lots of good training things. The training course we've got up there currently is an introduction to fundamentals of Spark. We don't do streaming and structured streaming inside there, but that'll be a course coming soon. If you do check out the training, don't forget, we do have the Spark fans discount. And then, yeah, don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll catch you with our next video. Cheers.